This is a tradition that began five years ago um, in honor of our dear Abby, we call her our dear Abby, who was founding uh, director of the Vera program and uh, who uh, we lost, it'll be five years uh, this June 19th that Abby passed away and um, uh, her loss is uh, palpable to uh, all of us uh, who have been involved with this program and, um, and her many students that she was so passionate about. And uh, passion was Abby. Um, she, um, uh, you know, took this program, uh, you know, which started as a, a vision, as an idea, and with Ca uh, Caroline and myself, turned it into this fantastic program that it is. And for those of you who don't know what it is, uh, the Vera Fellows Program is a very, it is actually a pioneer program here at John Jay College. It was the first program um, of its type, a fellowship program that provides uh, to uh, a select group of 10 students per year, um, a, a, a fabulous internship, paid internship opportunity at uh, the Vera Institute of Justice or one of its spin-off agencies where they work and get real life work experience um, on the ground at an agency and meet with uh, an interdisciplinary group of faculty once a week in seminar to, uh, to, to discuss rich literature, a, a rigorous program uh, a, a, of curriculum, and our discussions center on the fit or lack of fit between what the theory says and what the reality is on the ground. And sometimes what happens is we discover that uh, the theory is missing something that people are seeing and experiencing on the ground. And sometimes we discover that actually what goes on on the ground is missing perspective that theory can give us. And theory, again, from multiple uh, disciplines and multiple perspectives. So that's the, the Vera Fellowship Program in a nutshell. And um, I want to announce that um, the uh, applications are now open, so please spread the word for next year's cohort. Um, and the applications are due March 11th, and you can find them online. Um, so this program launched in 2008, so that means we're now in our 11th year. And that also means we have over 100 Vera Fellows who have graduated the program. And that's the thing about starting with a little idea or a big vision and then making it happen. And the effects it has had, which you will hear about tonight, on so many of our students. So, we, to honor our dear Abby, we established the Stein Memorial Lecture, annual lecture. And uh, I want to share with you very briefly um, a little bit about the previous Stein uh, lectures and lecturers. So there was one by uh, Vera alum Robert Riggs who talked about his experiences um, at NYU uh, as a PhD sociology student and the research that he was uh, doing there, fully funded doctoral uh, research. Nico Montano, who's right here. Nico, can you stand up? So glad you're here who talked about his experiences traveling and living in, in London as an MA student at two different universities. Now faculty at John Jay. And he, in London as a Marshall Scholar. And yes, now he's a, a faculty member here at John Jay. And he also worked for several years after graduating at the Vera Institute of Justice. And just told us this evening that he has a book contract with MIT Press. And we also had Poppy Begum, who uh, talked about her award-winning research um, that she conducted as an MA student when she was at Oxford University. Uh, she also is an adjunct professor here at John Jay, and she's a doctoral student at Rutgers University right now. And then last year, we had Lanisha, or Lenny as we call her, L Lewis Kirkwood, who received, after she graduated from John Jay, um, received a, an MA at Johns Hopkins, where she studied international relations 
and she is now stationed at the U.S. Embassy in Cairo, Egypt. And she came, yeah, yeah, and she, she came here last year and talked about what it was like to go from here <laughs> to there and all of the different kinds of experiences that she had. So um, uh, that's all I will say for, for now. And I would like to, we're very honored that we have John Jay College President Carol Mason with us this evening. And if you would come up and make a few remarks. Thank you. Oh, and as Carol is walking, President Mason is walking over, I want to let you all, we appreciate the financial support that we get from our donors that, who have made the John Jay Vera Fellows Program possible. And so I have envelopes here and cards. If anybody would like one, you can come and get one for me. Thank you. So Elise is a little more delicate than I'll be when I, after I say thank you and welcome. So thank you for being here. It's always exciting to be able to be here with our students and faculty um, to celebrate the wonderful things that are happening here. And I'm going to be sad to see some of them graduate, um, who I've gotten to know in my 18 months now, guys. It's been 18 months since I've been here. Um, but this is the Vera Fellows Program is a wonderful program, and particularly because it's with Vera. Um, I have a long history with Vera, and I was hoping we'd see Nick here tonight, but I know that he's got many things he's doing as well. But this program and what it does for our students is just phenomenal, and I'm looking forward to hearing our speaker because, um, you know, Elise alluded to it, and she and I have been in lectures before we talk about the power of voice. And so I think that, that what you're having the opportunity to do through this program is to learn how to use your voice and learn not just to use yours, but hear the voices of the people that you work with. Um, because that's what's really important in informing all of the work we do. And so those of you who are donors or future donors, because we hope that you'll be in one of the two categories before you leave here, um, thank you for supporting this work. And when you hear um, continue to speak on behalf of our students and get an opportunity to meet with the other students here, you'll see what a wonderful thing that you have an opportunity to support. And I just want to say thank you to Abby's family for being here and allowing us to honor her memory with you tonight. So let's give them a round of applause. And I must say that there were only a few of us who got that comment with Dear Abby. And every time you said it, I kept, think, I kept smiling and chuckling and looking around. I was like, they're not getting it. Um, but that's, I love that, that, that phrasing, dear Abby. So thank you for sharing her with us. And, and um, it's wonderful to see her vision a reality with all of these students here. So enjoy the evening. And I look forward to learning with you. Thanks. So I'm very happy to be able to introduce Kataja Brown. Uh, we had the fantastic... Um, I have the fortune of receiving a grant to develop a new VERA program. It's a VERA study abroad program, and we were able to implement it last year. And Katedra has, uh, has <laughs> taken advantage of it in such a wonderful way, and she uh, w went on the John Jay Study Abroad program to South Africa and taught our class today on student activism based on some incredible student activism that's happened in Cape Town, especially around the, the road statue. So she's going to share tonight her experience in South Africa and, and inspire us about student activism. Thank you, Katedra. Good evening, and thank you all for coming tonight. So as Professor Rose said, this January I had the lovely opportunity of being able to visit Cape Town, South Africa. It was my first time on the continent, which was amazing, because of the Vera Study Abroad grant. So the grant was started last year and allows fellows, previous and current fellows, to gain an international experience abroad relating and pertaining to social justice. So as a law and society major and an Africana studies minor, I'm always interested in the intersections between race, gender, and class, and how our laws and our policies can work to empower or restrain individuals and communities based on their identity. So my study abroad class examined the culture of race resistance and revolution pre and post apartheid through an interdisciplinary lens. Oh, 
Okay. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> so, using film, literature, music, journalism, and books, I was able to learn about the history and contemporary experience in South Africa. So, daily excursions included Longa, which I put to the right side of the, the slide. And Longa is one of the township communities established during the system of apartheid. I was also able to visit District 6, which was a community destroyed by the Groups Area Acts during apartheid, which displaced thousands of black and colored South Africans. And the land, um, after the displacement, the land is still unused by South African government today. So uh, um, on the left side, you can see from the top is the District 6 Museum. So for use by white persons only. And then underneath, apartheid forcibly evicted 60,000 people from District 6, most left with little more than a suitcase. Other excursions included trips to Robben Island, which was one of the three prisons that Nelson Mandela was incarcerated in before his release in the early 1990s. And then concurrently, I was able to do research at the University of Cape Town on the Roads Must Fall movement, where the students demanded the decolonization of their bodies from their educational institution, which was really powerful and impactful for me as a student at John Jay College. So here's some of the, the art and some of the representation of the movement during the time. So I spoke to different students, professors, and filmmakers about their roles in the movement with hopes of exploring the importance of activism in one's local community through the lens of student experience, establishing a greater understanding of what's necessary to lead a social movement, and also using my global experiences to share insights and leadership, activism, and community engagement in the United States. So I was able actually to share my findings today in a class. During the spring semester, the Vera Fellows teach a class um, of their choosing, and I was able to talk to my fellow peers and classmates about everything that I learned while in Cape Town. So aside from my academics, I also did touristy things, like go to <laughs> Baldur's Beach <laughs> and played with penguins, which you can see on the right. They're so cute. <laughs> and I also visited Table Mountain, one of the seven wond wonders of the world. So. Earlier, Professor Waterston mentioned how the program expanded vision, and I couldn't agree more with this. Thank you to Professors Rose Waterston and Professor Wright for literally giving me the opportunity to climb mountains. And <laughs> this program has been amazing and has expanded my cultural and professional goals and understanding of self. So thank you so much. I'm so honored to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. We love our Virons. That's what we call them. And now um, we are about to meet our uh, featured speaker this evening. And to make those introductions, Professor Rose is going to come up and share with you. So I'm th so thrilled to have the opportunity to introduce Andrean Wright. Uh, Andrine is not only my former student, but she's now a member of my Chi Town family. Uh, meeting with my father, a retired political science professor, on an Evanston uh, beach walk. Yes, there are beautiful beaches in Chicago, and yes, you can see the other. You can't see to the other side of Lake Michigan, and yes, that's why it's called a Great Lake. And no, I'm not defensive about how beautiful Chicago is. <laughs> People don't understand. <laughs> so. Um, I'm, so my father, who's, uh, and, and Andreen discussed her future as a political science scholar. My father's scholarship was about housing at the intersection of race and class. So the, the two of them were basically skipping down the beach in Evanston together holding hands. Uh, and Andreen was such a delight to have in the Vera seminar. She had and continues to have big ideas that were always fortified by her significant experiences in the real world. Her passion and conviction were effectively conveyed through her analysis of the youth justice system, questioning why the organizations they were supposed to help didn't mirror the populations that they serve. The world of social justice is f fortunate to have Andrine Wright as an advocate for policy that actually reflects the experience of people in the systems that are most affected. I'm honored to announce our speaker, Andrine Wright. <laughs> Hi. 
My name is Andrine. I'm super happy to be here today um, as Professor Rose and Professor Waterston introduced myself. Um, I'm a PhD student at Northwestern University studying political behavior at the intersections of race, gender, and class. I am currently a second year student, um, really enjoying my time there, but you'll soon hear all about it. Um, super happy to be here. Thank you all for coming. Um, let's get started. I'm going to jump right into it and show you guys this picture of my family. So um, I am a proud child of immigrants. My, ma my family, my entire family moved here from Jamaica. The one right there in the red and black sweater, her name is Valerie, and she moved here first, bringing then my grandma, my grandpa, and everybody there that you see. I wanted to start off with this picture because I do think that as an immigrant family, like most immigrant families, a lot of the pillars that a lot of, it, that of immigrant families have is valuing education. Education is absolutely number one. Right next to it is religion. <laughs> That's just kind of how it goes. Education and religion, those are the two we do not mess with. Um, <laughs> my mother, she's the foxy one in the, <laughs> the leopard-ish print dress going. I know, right? Nice. Um, and so she was a physician assistant for about really um, before I was born, I think she was a physician assistant. And um, she married my father, who also moved here from Jamaica. Both are immigrants. My father has a small business in Flatbush. Um, and when they got married, they moved to Long Island, and that's where I was raised. Um, after that, um, just to jump into what happens next, um, in 2013, I went to Michigan State University. 2012, I graduated from high school. And I was at Michigan State University for a year. And unfortunately, my mom was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. Um, so I wasn't able to afford staying at Michigan State University. Um, a lot of things happened, really uprooted um, stuff with my family. Um, and all of that is fine and well, but I, the reason why I brought that up is because my family has been a huge support system since then. We were really able to pick things up um, at a time where we really weren't sure what was going to happen. Um, and a lot of them stepped up to make sure that I had the freedom to do what I wanted to do. Um, and so I wanted to start off with them, and I wanted to appreciate and acknowledge how amazing they are, how they have been, how supportive they have been. My cousin's in the back, and so is my sister. Say hello. <laughs> They've been amazing. So everything that you're about to see on this slideshow, I really could not have done it without the support of them. Um, and so, yeah, moving on. I moved, I le after my mom got diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's, I then transferred back into New York um, and went to John Jay College. Um, <laughs> and so when I came to John Jay College, I immediately started the, wasn't immediately, no, I think it was maybe a year after, um, I was introduced to the Ronald E. McNair program. Um, and the reason why I was so valuable was because, um, again, like many immigrant families, we really only had two different choices. I grew up wanting to either be a lawyer or be a doctor. <laughs> like it was one of the two. There was no other thing that I could have done. Um, and so because I liked to talk and argue, which is what my my father said he wanted me <laughs> to be a lawyer and so that was what I wanted to done like how what I've wanted to do since I was seven years old went to Michigan State getting ready to do lawyer to be a lawyer um, and then I came to John Jay College and a well, professor <laughs> Dr. Magic who ended up being my mentor at Ronald E. McNair um, she actually put me aside yes yeah, she's right here um, she actually <laughs> pulled me aside and she asked she's like Andreen what do you want to do? Like, why, what do you want to do in your career? And I said, I wanted to be a lawyer. And she was like, why? <laughs> like, she literally said, just like that. She was like, why? And I'm like, well, no, I don't know, because I like the law. Like, I mean, because to be honest, like, I, I enjoyed learning, and I enjoyed learning law, but I didn't really see myself actually practicing to be a lawyer. Um, and I had Dr. Magic in my women's and politics course. And so she saw the interest that I had in it, and then she pulled me aside and said, you know, I think you should think about graduate school. Never thought about graduate school. Didn't even think that was a thing. Didn't know PhD programs were funded. Didn't know anything. <laughs> Didn't know any of that. Um, but with the help of Dr. Magic in the Ronald E. McNair program, um, I ended up getting, um, they helped me with my GRE, studying for my GRE. They helped me with applying to colleges um, for grad school. I even did the um, 
Midwestern Political Science Association conference, the poster conference with the help of um, Dr. Magic again. My project was, um, gosh, <laughs> de decoding the clubhouse and intersectional analysis of black girls in STEM. Um, and so I presented that at MPSA. Um, and it was a phenomenal experience. Like I really enjoyed it and I think that Again, any of these opportunities that I list now, I did not have, um, I knew nothing about um, until I went to the Ronald E. McNair program, and so I appreciated that. Um, and I think that this was also the first time I learned the value of networking. Um, it was the first time when there was a group of students who, like myself, wanted to be in grad school and was doing the necessary steps to get there. Um, and then that whole value of networking, I end up coming back to in my grad school quarter, which we'll talk about soon. So moving on, after I was done with the, well, while I was in the Ronald E. McNair program, I also applied to the Vera Fellowship program. And in the Vera Fellowship program, I worked for the Vera Institute of Justice for the, for the <laughs> um, Status Offense Reform Center. Um, and what the Status Offense Refor Resource Center did, um, it was a branch of the Center for Youth Justice. And um, is anyone familiar with what status offenses are by any chance? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, no. I, I, if you raise your hand, I'd love to hear like what status offenses are shared. Exactly. So status offenses are crimes that are usually that are criminalized based on your age, right? And so um, truancy is one of them. Absentee, being absent from school, running away, um, and a lot of the times, a lot of students who end up being um, disproportionately impacted from these status offenses are young people of color. And so for the status offense reform center, what I did was we we worked with a toolkit that helps to give. Um, I know one of the toolkits that I gave to was for um, a city in, Vir in Virginia, um, and it helps give different guidelines as to how to go about um, status offenses instead of it being criminalized, instead of them just throwing them in jail, right? Other type of resources that will rehabilitate instead of incarcerate, right? Um, and so this picture right here is also, I think this was, was this the Abby Stein Memorial Lecture too? Oh, yeah, so I think this was last year's, no, Nico. Was it Nico's? <laughs> so, I don't, <laughs> so this was for Nico's lecture. Um, and so again, the power of net, oh, and then this, the picture right here, this was for a, um, I ended up doing the John Jay College 2020 campaign. I, are they really, are they going to air that? I'm not too sure, for real. The 2020, not now, not now, just in 2020. I'm not too sure if, I never heard anything from it after, but all that to say, I'm sorry. Um, this is, <laughs> all that to say, this was, um, I talked about my experiences at Vera for this campaign. Um, and if it does air in 2020, then that's Wait, awesome. I think it was air, mm -hmm. aired at an earlier gala. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was. But then if you looked on um, YouTube, it says John Jay College Campaign 2020. Oh, it does. Yeah, it's okay. Anyway, but... Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll make sure that's... <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so uh, anyway, those are what these two pictures show. Um, and again, I, I really appreciated the value of network for Vera as well. As Dr. Waterston talked about, the Vera Institute of Justice provided us with an opportunity to talk about our experiences in our um, respective areas where we did, um, where we did our work, and then also talked about, provided us with readings to kind of have this, 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 this um, dialect of uh, this talk between the readings that were in um, the field that we were working in and then actually related to the work that we were actually doing. Um, and that I think was probably the closest to a graduate seminar I came in contact with at John Jay College. Um, also, while because of all the other things that I ended up doing, um, McNair, um, Vera, I applied for the um, Rising Star Fellowship, which Dr. Waterston also helped me get. And the Rising Star Fellowship, what I used that for was to go visit Senegal. Um, and so in Senegal, I worked for, it was a program through City College. And through City College's program, we built eco-villages eco um, all throughout Dakar. Not all throughout Dakar. It was Dakar was one of the sites we visited, and then we went up towards Mauritania to a place called Giri Chantier. And in Giri Chantier, we built eco-villages. One of my particular jobs at that time was to teach English because the reason why they wanted to learn was because they wanted to build, they wanted to acknowledge and spread the, the word about eco-villages and the need to have eco-villages in these communities. And what an eco-village is, is that everything that is provided through the earth is then recycled, is resourced. One of the examples of talking about eco-villages is when they use, this is kind of a nasty example, but again, it's, it's all recyclable resources, using cow dung 
and using like cow poop um, and then recycling that to use as coal. Um, and so again, all these resources that you can then recycle to build and sustain yourself within villages, that was the goal of this program at Senegal. Um, I really enjoyed it, it really did. It, I taught, um, I taught a lot of adults at the time because a lot of them learned French. I didn't know too much French. I still don't know too much French. Um, but I, the, again, my perp the purpose of what we were doing, at least my, my, my role there, was to teach um, a lot of these older folks who wanted to learn English so that they can go on radio shows and spread the word, um, go to other places. There was a big um, green eco-village conference that they wanted to then talk about what their city was doing. Um, and so that was a really fun experience. Um, and so then, after I was done with the Rising Star Fellowship and going to Senegal, I also applied for the Summer Research Opportunities Program. Um, any of graduate students who are currently interested in going to grad school, I would highly suggest looking up the Summer Research Opportunities Program. It's a program that um, you would then go to the school that you are interested in or that you apply to and do research under, the advisors, uh, under an advisor at that institution. And so at that time, I applied for the Summer Research Opportunities Program through the McNair, listing that I am McNair, listing that I am Vera, listing that I did blah, blah, blah. Um, and then I um, got accepted into Northwestern Summer Research Opportunity Program and worked with my advisor, who's Alvin Tillery right there in the blue shirt. Um, and the value of what I did there was, again, learning Northwestern, learning how to be in graduate school, learning what the type of, the type of things that I would then be doing. Um, and he is now, even though he worked for me for, even though I worked for him in this research group um, for the Summer Research Opportunity program he is now currently in my advisor at Northwestern um, and that really started a transition <laughs> of me going to grad school because as soon as that was finished I was nominated for the early admission um, e early admission for the political science department as EADP I forgot what the D was for um, but anyway it was an early admissions decision decision program and <laughs> <laughs> and so after I was nominated by that through Alvin Tillery, then I got my acceptance into Northwestern. And it was kind of a done deal for me. I applied to two other schools, but um, I really felt like Northwestern already poured so much resources into me. I was already um, acclimated into Northwestern. I knew some of the faculty members. I presented the research that I worked over the summer with, and they all came to see me. Um, and so I, I was already set. Um, and I think that when you're evaluating graduate school programs, you really do have to think about the type of resources and support you'd get at the graduate school that you decide to go to. And Northwestern has proved that they would provide for me in the way that I thought that they would, even to this day. Um, so, boom, now I'm at Northwestern. It's 2017, um, and I'm at Northwestern, and I am starting, to be honest, I kind of hit the ground running. Uh, is anyone familiar with the quarter system or know of any? Okay, so if you're at all familiar with the quarter system, you know this thing is, f oh, okay, well, all right, it's fast. <laughs> so the same way that John Jay College has semester systems, and it has about like, what, four months, I think, in one semester, four to six months, the quarter system is four to eight weeks. So every single quarter is four to eight weeks, and we're still congesting, synthesizing all the work you do in one semester in one quarter. So this is like the fastest pace I've ever taken. Um, in graduate in any type of uh, learning environment. So that took a lot to get used to. Um, but it also prepared me in ways that I didn't think I, I could have done. So like it really pushed the limit. So what I mean by that is um, the first year that I came to Northwestern, I started working on a paper with these two individuals in the on the right. Um, Dara Gaines and Justin Zimmerman, they are also in my cohort, also working on race, ethnicity, and policy work. Um, and we wrote a paper called Race, um, Power, and Policy. Um, it's, oh, I have the actual title. Race, Power, and Policy, the Making of the Mulford Act. And what that looked at is like racial, is, was, was racialized attitudes towards gun control. And so after I was done doing that paper with them, also in this picture is Carol Mosley. Um, the, she is actually the first African-American US senator. She's also a visiting professor at Northwestern. Yeah, Northwestern brings a lot of powerful people. Um, but yeah, so she also helped me with this paper that we did. Um, and then I ended up presenting it at the National Conference of Black Political Science, again in my first year, not something <laughs> that I would have done in my first year of John Jay College or any, really anywhere else. I really think it was the quarter system that kind of pushed, that kind of pushed this going, that kind of pushed um, me to do this with them. Um, and I also really wanna talk about the value of your cohort and doing these term papers together. Um, I, 
again, I don't think I could have done this project. I don't think I could have finished my first year if it weren't for this cohort right here. Um, a lot of them have helped me through times that I didn't, <laughs> it's too much to say, anyway, have helped me in ways that I didn't think imaginable. Um, and I think that, again, when evaluating graduate school, another thing you should really think about is the cohort you're coming into. Um, Again, they're the ones that's going to be there from you from the start to finish, hopefully. Um, but also keep in mind that graduate school, it's your own race. It's a marathon, not a sprint, yes, but it's your own race. Um, we'll talk about that later. Maybe you guys can ask me questions about that. But uh, all that to say, the value of cohorts, the value of networking um, through graduate school. And again, NCOPES. Um, uh, that's about it. And so after NCOPES, <laughs> These are all different things that I ended up doing, which is great. After NCOPES, I then realized that um, my first year, actually, through MCOPES and through doing my first year, I realized that methods training in political science is real. Like, the type of work that we did in John Jay College um, was amazing. I loved political science here. But if you're doing it on the graduate level, you really need to know your methods. Like, I mean time series. I mean statics. I mean, like, probability and statistics. I mean, I don't know, linear models. Everything under this. And I'm not a strong math person. I could assure you, like, I was never good in, I'm still not good in math. But I can get by. Um, but all that to say, I had to end up being creative in graduate school to think, to think about ways to leverage my resources. Um, and one of the ways in doing so was to ask. I also wasn't a big asking person. Like I kind of, I applied to a lot of things. If there was a poster, I applied to it. Dr. Magic knows. I was very, <laughs> I'm a very curious person. Even for things that I shouldn't spend my time with, I'll apply. But if there isn't something that invites me to do so, I won't. I won't ask. I won't talk. That's a really big thing that graduate school teaches you to do, is if you don't ask, you won't get. And so what I mean by that is I received literally <laughs> four funding opportunities here, two of them that I got just by asking. I ended up getting the American Political Science Association Minority Fellowship. Um, that was actually a poster that I applied for, which was great. And I'm, <laughs> and I, I'm happy I got it. But um, after that, I realized that I needed more money. After, and after that, I asked, I asked APSA to then fund me some more so that I can do ICPSR, which is the Inter-University inter 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 Consortium for Political and Social Research. That's what ICPSR stands for. I'll talk a little bit about what exactly that is. Um, but anyway, this was an I ended up asking for more money to go to this program, and I ended up getting the APSA Minority Fellowship, what I said, the Press Dodge Fenno, which again, I reached out and asked for. It wasn't an application project. I said I needed money. Press Dodge Fenno, P-R-E-S-T-A-G-E Fenno. So that was a grant that only that again you would ask for through APSA, or they and sometimes they even find funds for you. I also got the APSA Northwestern Minor Summer Research Grant, um, and then I got the um, the Center for Study of Diversity and Democracy. They I also asked them for funds to do this. And the reason why this particular program was so important was again because of the methods training I need. ICPSR was a program that's basically math camp. It's from all different universities, Michigan State University, University of Michigan, Stanford, every type of university, not every type, but a lot of universities in the US actually it was rooted, was um, partnered with ICPSR. And so a lot of those students end up coming here and then doing math in their math camp. In there, I ended up doing, um, I ended up learning race, ethnicity, and quantitative methods. And then I did a scaling and dimensional analysis class. Again, methods is very important, at least in grad school. And so for me to get the training that I needed, I again, had to be creative. I had to talk. I had to say for the things that I, I had to talk about the things that I needed. And luckily, I got it. Um, and so that was an excellent opportunity, but that was also a life lesson for me. Um, graduate school is not going to hold your hand. I, don't, I, I do think that there are resources that, n that Northwestern has provided for me, but I would not have been able to, got to, have get to receive it if I had not opened my mouth and asked. Um, so this was a very big learning experience for me. And so talking about some of my current projects that I'm working on, um, the first one, which I mentioned before, was race, power, and policy. So even though the paper is written and we presented, we're still working on publishing in it, publishing it together. So that's one of those, again, the racialized attitudes towards gun control. Um, one of the things that I used was newspapers and looking at the attitudes that um, these newspapers had towards people, bla the Black Panther Party in particular. Um, so the Black Panther Party, had a lot of young people as well that was involved in the Black Panther Party and listening to the type of rhetoric that they had and how they ended up categorizing um, 
the Black Panther Party and just and them defending themselves, that was a big part of my paper in the way that you wouldn't hear that categorization for white people carrying guns themselves, right? And so that was the big, the big mission for that paper was to show these type of discrepancies. Um, that paper will be, we're waiting to get it published in another year, but uh, we'll see. <laughs> and so another paper that I'm currently working on is, the, is a juvenile justice paper with Jalisa Munez. She's in the School of Education and Social Policy. And she currently, we're working now on having me added to her IRB because she's currently doing some work in it, um, looking at learning environments within the carceral spaces. And what I will then bring is the civic engagement that we see um, that these individuals then engage in. Um, that'll be my expertise. This is a very early project, so we're still working on the IRB to do so. Um, but I'm really excited for this, um, also because of my background in the Status Offense Reform Center at the Vera Institute of Justice. Um, the Sisterhood Project actually ties in with my own project. So the Sisterhood Project is a branch out of an unsilenced lab, which Northwestern sponsors. The unsilenced lab is, um, is, a, pr is a program that aims to look at voices that have been silenced, marginalized communities, people who, uh, who, su who suffer, gosh, people who um, are subjected to racism, sexism, homophobia, depression, um, all these different vectors. This, the Unsilenced Labs aims is to illuminate these voices that often get unheard. And so the Sisterhood Project is a new project that was rooted, that started in Inglewood area on the south side, where mothers would come together, all mothers who have lost their sons to gun violence. And so this then, um, learning about their um, narratives, learning about the type of the voices that people often say men, they deserved it, they were in the gang, they, they were this, they were that. Um, and so learning from these mothers who um, actually lost their sons and try to illuminate their, the voices that were gone. Um, that was a big project for me that I'm really excited to start doing. Um, another thing that we'll end up doing with the Sisterhood Project is they asked me to moderate a panel with Tamir Rice's mom. Um, and so, yeah, I know. <laughs> it's going to be some heavy stuff, but that's going to start in April. Right now we're doing some interviews and learning about the, the sons who, um, the sons who, was killed, who were killed, and then learning about the mothers who try to again um, keep their legacy alive. And after we're done with those interviews and some of the and learning about their stories, we'll then have a interactive art museum at the Chicago Institute of Art. Um, yeah, it's going to be a great, great exhibit. Um, that's going to happen before the panel with Tamir Rice. But a big reason why I wanted to do this was, again, to get involved in the South Side area, to get involved in Chicago politics, to get involved in people that live in Chicago, because this is going to be this is going to be a huge chunk of my research, learning about different perspectives, which leads me to my own research project. So my own research project is in Chicago politics. If you guys are familiar with Chicago politics, it's some messy stuff. Um, it's some really messy stuff. <laughs> and so um, one of the things that I'm looking at is going to look at black women in particular and the different varying perspectives towards the um, one party democratic machine. So one thing that separates Chicago in, from other cities is that it is a one party democratic machine, which means that there is no competition with Republican parties. Everyone who is running on the mayoral, on the mayoral ballot are Democrats. And, um, and so look, looking at the variations of black women and looking at them in three different areas. Um, so I'm looking at them in West Inglewood. I'm looking at them in an area called Beverly, which, which is affluent. And then I'm looking at Hyde Park. And so I'll be conducting focus groups with a lot of these women just learning about the different type of interactions that they have with the state and how these type of interactions can, affect, can eventually affect their trust in government, which then, can, which then um, transcends to their trust to the one party democratic machine, right? And I think that this is important work just because a lot of times when we look at political behavior and from uh, from marginalized communities, it's kind of a one track homogenous thing, like all black women re relate this way. Um, and that's not the case. Looking at different social positionalities for black women in particular, um, I think is really important, especially since I know some people think about um, black women as the backbone to the Democratic Party. We can kind of unpack that and why we think that, um, if you'd like. But another reason is that in the head of a lot of these poverty neighborhoods, black women are at the face of these pov concentrated poverty neighborhoods because black men are are incarcerated. Black men are, they're poli they're, they've been policed, right? Um, and so looking at these type of narratives, I think, are important. Um, and so that's a project that I'll be doing that, that I plan on 
that I plan on reaching through Sisterhood Project to then get some people to work into my focus groups or even use like a snowball effect to get some more people to be applicants for my focus group. Um, I'm working on doing that IRB. It should be done by next week, so I'm really excited about that. Um, and then I should start doing my focus groups next month. Normally the IRB process takes about a month. Um, hopefully I don't have to revise. And even if I do revise, I still think it should be within the month. Um, but that's one of my bigger projects and that should work for my second year paper, which will then hopefully feed into my dissertation. Um, and other than that, I, I, th I think that's it. Do I have more time or did I go past 40 minutes? Uh, no, but um, you can, it's up to you. Uh, if you okay. Have, we can stop here and have, take questions. Okay, well, uh, that's all I have for you right now. I'm really open to questions. I'm sorry if I talk too fast. I can clarify any type of points that you guys have for me. Um, but other than that, thank you for coming. I really appreciate you listening and that's all. <laughs>
the, the, the way to, to reach the success, which is through our education. Mm -hmm. and yeah. And I just wanted to thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, ask, ask. I'm here for you. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. Thank you. That's a great question. So the paper that I did for the race, power, and politics specifically looked at a lot of historical content because it looked at the Mulford Act um, during the Black Panther era. But I do think about the ways in which we think about guns in black people's hands that we don't think about in white people's hands. Um, and so when I think about Chicago and the gun violence in Chicago, I often like, OK. So the paper that <laughs> so the paper that I'm doing right now, right now I'm currently doing focus groups just to understand a little bit of the the type of things that um, people in Inglewood are doing. Uh, people of Inglewood are, are are engaging themselves in in politics, and a lot of the, the a lot of the things that they're doing, a lot of these grassroots organizations that they're doing, is helping to revitalize the community in ways that um, would then make it safer, right? And I personally don't. The, another narrative that we hear about Chicago is the, the first thing you think about is the black on black violence. So these communities aren't doing anything for their own. These communities are, they, they allow this to happen, blah, 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 blah. Um, and that's obviously, I hope everyone thinks it's bull. <laughs> but, but yeah, and so, and then looking and starting my research within the actual communities, I have never seen the amount of grassroots organization the way that Chicago has ever done. Like I have never, these people are out and, 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 and it's, it transcends across classes too. Like it is mostly um, lower income, middle income, but I think that it's a way that, that leverages every, every sing, everything you can think about. I, I can't even, I have actually have a, pan, I wish I took a picture of the pamphlet, um, but type of things like opening up the health clinic, type of things like making sure their parks are clean, type of things like making sure the food is safe in their neighborhood, little things that kind of play a part in revitalizing these lower income communities that are subjected to this gun violence, right? Um, and so I think about, I personally, when I think about gun violence, I do think about the ways in which a lot of people aren't reflecting on the work that's being done. A lot of people are really quick to say that if someone got shot in the South Side area, that they must have been dealing with drugs. They must have been in, um, they must have been doing something they weren't supposed to do. And oftentimes it's never really about the situations that even brought them to that to begin with, right? So, I mean, so even thinking about, there's a gang da database right now in Chicago. I don't know if you've, if anyone's heard about it, but there's a gang database that has all these people who have been arrested or had any type of interaction with um, the criminal justice system. They have a database of just people who they believe are in gangs. And one of the big initiatives that Chicago is currently doing within these grassroots organizations is making sure that that's abolished, right? Um, but the, it's a constant, constant effort. Like these grassroots organizations, it's a constant working. Um, and a lot of the ways that they do that is to make sure that the mayors that are running are held accountable for doing these things. And so, yeah, I think about the type of initiatives personally. Like I think when I think about gun violence, I think about the type of initiatives that a lot of these communities that suffer from it are doing to, to, to rectify that, to kind of change that, to make these cities safer. Um, again, that's not often talked about. It often is not addressed, so. Mm -hmm. Silenced, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hi. What's your name? Kateja, hi. Oh yes, Kateja, hi. <laughs> Oh yes, girl. Oh yes. I'd love to talk about that. So, <laughs> so um, as a woman of color at Northwestern, um, where to begin? You said briefly. Um, okay, so I'm gonna follow up. Would you like to know about my experience teaching as a black woman of color or would you like to know my experience as a graduate student, black woman of color in my discipline of political science? As a student? Okay, so as a student, um, First and foremost, doing any type of race, talk about both, oh gosh. <laughs> okay, um, so um, 
first and foremost, thinking about the research that I'm doing, intersectional research, race, ethnicity, politics, that type of research normally um, in my political science department, I'm really lucky to have faculty that does that kind of work um, because oftentimes when we do political science work, it's, it's very traditional, it's very institutions, it's very much like Congress, voting, blah, 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 blah. Um, and for me, I find that oftentimes when I'm dealing with or talking with the research that I'm doing with people who aren't familiar, um, they're very quick to kind of combat it in ways that they wouldn't for other people. Um, so it's, it's very much, I don't want to say you're always on the defense, but you kind of are. Like you, you kind of always have to know what you're doing and be really confident in what you're saying, confident in the research it being important, right? It's all, you always have to kind of advocate for this importance. Like why does it matter? Why does race matter? Why does studying black women matter, right? And so that's the type of interaction that I often have with um, doing graduate school in political science. Um, and as being a black woman, I think that a lot of times people even, and I don't like this either, they project the stuff that I end up researching. And so what I mean is like if I ended up going into a space that was white in political science, like I could just come there and they'll know I'm studying race or they'll expect me to study race or they'll expect, and, and it kind of like diminishes the kind of work that I do end up doing. Um, and they kind, and, and, and in that way, it's, again, on the defense. You really got to know your stuff. <laughs> Jesus. Um, <laughs> but um, <laughs> but it, it is rewarding. Like, I oftentimes, oftentimes when, I'm, when I'm faced with those type of challenges, I tell myself, like, the type of work, not only do I tell myself that this work is important, but these are people's lives, right? This is not just about um, the way, like, this is not just separation of powers. Like, this is, it, it does play a part, right? But this is, it's, it's about people's livelihoods, right? This is about people's actual existence um, in ways that I think other type of research and other type of disciplines don't capture. And a lot of times that's taxing, right? Because if someone then talks about your research, you, it, it's hard to kind of separate the fact that you feel this way about me as a black woman when you're talking about attacking the type of research that I'm doing, right? Um, it's a lot of different balancing. It's a lot of different emotions that come into it, but again, I take value in the type of work that I'm doing because I know that this is, again, of, of people's lives um, in ways that I don't think other people could understand. And maybe, maybe it's not for them to understand. You know, is it maybe still grappling, still grappling with it. Um, but that, that's, that's really how it is as a student, um, as a teacher, Jesus. So as a, I'm sorry. So as a teacher, <laughs> as a teacher, so Northwestern students are amazing. I'll start, I'll start there. But as you know, Northwestern is a very, it's a PWI, predominantly white institution. Um, and so I'm currently taking a gender colloquium with Jennifer Nash. She does a lot of intersectional work. Um, and what we talk about too is the evaluation. Because we, all, as TAs, we also get course evaluations. Um, and I was studying the type of course evaluations that I was getting as a teacher for constitutional law, because I taught that my first quarter. Um, and the type of evaluations that I would then get um, was like, oh, um, she was okay. Like, she was nice. You know, she was sweet. She smiled a lot. She's very welcoming, very, you know, very pleasant, um, very warm, you know. Um, she answers emails. <laughs> um, but as far as the, and then my, my co-TA, his name was, um, I don't know how to put names, but he was, all, I can, his name was Warren, and he was a white man, um, and he also taught con law with me. And the type of things that he got was very much on like the type of intellect that he had. Um, you know, he was he was really smart. He was he was great. He was this. He was that. And I believe it. Now I believe it. However, um, the type of the amount of different responses that I got did not always reflect the type of responses he got. Um, and so I think that teaching um, that was kind of the things that I ended up seeing. I also, which is, this is a weird thing. I haven't grappled with this too. I also was a grader um, outside of con law. I graded, for, um, I graded for the School of Education and Social Policy. It was a Holocaust class, which was very interesting. Yeah. Um, and so being a grader for that, I got like reviews of, and this is, this is not discussion. So when you're a grader, you just grade the papers, you give responses, you give reviews, but you don't actually have a conversation with your students um, in the ways that I did with con law. And so the type of responses I got for that was, oh, she's really smart. She has like really, really great, get great advice. She's a great reviewer, blah, 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 blah. And I'm thinking to myself, you didn't even hear me talk. Like we did not interact at any point. Um, 
other than the great, anyway. Um, and so I think there's definitely something to unpack about that. Um, there's a lot of unpacking when you, do, when you do this type of work as a black woman, as any type of marginalized group, right? Um, but that, that was my experience. I'm expecting my experience and my C, it'll be very interesting to see my CTEX um, course evaluations for African American politics that I'm doing this quarter. So I'll keep you guys updated on that. Sure. So <laughs> I'm too short. <laughs> so sure. So um, the course that I teach now, it's with Dr. Ruel Rogers. Um, it's called African American Politics. So some of the things that we taught, so this week we were talking about, we were talking about concentrated poverty. Um, we were also talking about black mayors and white voters. So we're talking about the hollow prize problem. Um, what, the hollow pro what the hollow prize problem is, is basically thinking about the type of resources that black mayors then have to be utilized with when a lot of, when a lot of people end up moving. Um, white flight, right? And the type of resources that then have to be leveraged in ways that other mayors don't have to adapt to. Um, Sorry. And so um, the t I really enjoyed this class because, again, this is the type of work that I end up doing. So um, the students are really, they are pretty, they are really, they're, they're great conversationalists. Um, reading that, I just graded their first paper this week. Um, and their first paper was talking about Atlanta and how um, mayors are black in Atlanta and how that descriptive representation doesn't automatically reach substantive representation, right? Um, so just because you're a black mayor does not mean that you're gonna advocate for the type of policies that black people need or all black people for that matter, right? And so um, th they're, uh, they're honestly brilliant. Like they're really, really great and they end up, they do, they do relate to the type of material that, they, that they're reading about, even though they are white. I also had one paper, <laughs> gosh, I also had one paper that gave me a, um, that gave me like a synopsis of her whiteness. And she was like, oh, um, I know I'm evaluating black people and I know that I'm gonna talk about this, so please forgive me if my whiteness comes out. And, and please forgive me if I don't understand, the, if I don't understand, and I, and I get it, I, it's fine, 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 fine. Um, how <laughs> <laughs> but it also wasn't, it kind of wasn't the place to do it. Um, <laughs> and so um, seeing that too has been different. Um, but I do like the curiosity. And I think that this generation, like we were talking about that too, how this generation of people are also tolerant in ways that other generations haven't been. Um, and I see that in my students. I definitely see that. Um, they're definitely, they definitely do try. This wasn't a course that people were forced to be at. This was something they volunteered to learn about. Um, and so I do appreciate, I love teaching this in ways I did not like, I mean, I like con law. I liked con law, but African-American politics, man, that's my course. Um, but yeah, that's that's my teaching experience thus far. I'll let you again. I'll let you know about how the C techs are. Um, I don't think I'll see too much variation because the, my coti is actually also a black woman. So I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. But that's my teaching experience. <laughs> yeah, hi Nico. What's up? <laughs> this is so exciting. Is I'm it? So proud of you. Thank you. Uh, so my question is, mm -hmm. you know, given the world we live in, mm -hmm. you're Northwestern, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Both from the students you have around you and down here, right? Mm-hmm. So different. Well, it looks like New York. Oh, man. Mm -hmm. um, Northwestern might not necessarily look like Chicago. Mm -mm. No. Uh, say that. Yes. Um, it's true. And so, I am, on top of that, a lot of us are first generation, mm -hmm. college students, mm -hmm. and then again. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, <laughs> I still have it now. Um, <laughs> yeah. How, how was that? Because I think that's yeah. one of the most valuable lessons that it's true. Of us have gone through that like, transition. And yeah. Like, what's going on? And like, those who might be afraid or, or just looking beyond them, they were like, what the hell do I do? Yeah. Imposter syndrome is real. So any of you guys that aren't familiar with imposter syndrome, that's when you end up coming into um, places like graduate school and you think about um, how you, you can't amount. You, you, you have inadequacies, you don't belong here. This, this feeling of unbelonging, right? Um, and you're right, imposter syndrome has, has started. <laughs> I definitely had imposter syndrome the first time, mainly because 
everything I ended up listing to you guys were opportunities that I ended up leveraging, but they were all like diverse, like Summer Research Opportunities Program was a diversity initiative. Um, me getting into McNair, a diversity initiative. All these different affirmative action diversity initiatives that ultimately brought me to Northwestern, a PWI. Um, and I personally was grappling with that for my first year, and I also think that other people were too, right? It wasn't just me. Um, and so that kind of, imp it, it's still something that I'm working through. I'm not necessarily, I don't want to sound like a Debbie Downer, but I, I'm not necessarily sure if it goes away. Um, I think there's always going to be times in which I think about the work that I'm doing and compare it to somebody else. Even though you, sh I know you're not supposed to, I told you all not to do it. I told you all it's your own race. This is me talking to you, but also talking to myself. Um, because it's really, it's really easy to get to that. Like it's when you're doing this type of work that again, a lot of other graduate students also aren't doing. Um, a lot of other graduate students aren't doing race, ethnicity, and politics work, right? Um, and so doing that work for, again, people that might not understand also <laughs> results to me feeling like I'm not doing valuable things or that, I, I, that I'm alone in this, like I'm isolated, right? Um, that I don't belong. Because if other people aren't seeing the value of it, right, then why am I at a place that, 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 that doesn't bring in people that do, if that makes sense. Like it's, it's, it's a lot of different, it's a lot, again, a lot of different feelings, a lot of different unpacking, but I, some advice for imposter syndrome, because I'm sure it will come, is one, thinking about how it is your own race. You are there for a reason. Um, even, even though your trajectory, trajectory in getting there, trajectories, um, in getting there isn't similar to the cohort that you're in, um, you're still there. You're there and you, you, you did a race in which other people wished, dreamed, could have been into, a, a position that other people wish that they could have had, right? And so you, uh, for me, I, I think about that a lot. Like I think of a lot of people who would love to be in graduate school, a lot of my peers who would love to have these opportunities, a lot of people who aren't my peers, who, are, who didn't have the type of opportunities that I have who would love to be there. Um, and not to say that you're, you're doing it for them, but to say that they, that you, you, that you had purpose, right? You have purpose in this position, um, that your research is important for that reason, for these communities that do not have um, the opportunities that you were afforded for, right? Um, so there's that, there's running your own race. Um, really, I, I, it's a really psychological thing and it's hard. It's hard to think about things that'll lift you up when, when graduate school and academia in general is really isolating, but really just don't compare yourself to others. Know that you have purpose, know that you're there for a reason, know that whatever cosmos aligned was, again, happened for a reason. Um, and uh, y your work is valuable. Always, always value the work that you're doing, because if, if not you, then, I mean, come on. Like, um, but yeah, I, I hope that helps. I don't, <laughs> I, that's something that helps me. <laughs> How much? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you do. You definitely do. It's true. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Yeah. So, uh, and it's related to what you just said. Mm -hmm. published that is not, um, that is directed to a larger public audience, if I'm correct, that doesn't, is not to be written like a scholarly mm. Mm. And when I hear what you're describing your work, um, it, it, to me it's like uh, it completely and totally and wonderfully important. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, thinking about the future, yeah. um, what do you want to do when you finish your research and you write your dissertation, mm -hmm. and you graduate, and you have your doctorate. What, is your, what are your ideas about postgraduate school? Yeah. In just in terms of work, yeah. but also in terms of publishing your work. Mm -hmm. dissemi I should say, disseminating your work to, you know, wh who are the audiences you're imagining? I like that, yeah. So I like that question, especially when you're thinking about um, the type of jobs that I want to do. I've grappled with that too. Still just trying to get through coursework, but I have grappled with it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, one of the things that I think about is how I don't want 
my type of work to still just be in academia. Like I think that, and that's why I try to, when people ask me what I want to do for my future, it's never just being a tenured professor. Like it's, it's, it's twofold. I, it, it's going to be me being an academic professor, but also either running my own organization or being a part of, being something, with it, being something that's going to be a research for the community. I'm really not too sure what that looks like yet. <laughs> but I can say that I do miss that kind of balance that I, I sort of got in at John Jay College because I did work for the Bear Institute of Justice, the Stats Reform, the Stats Defense Reform Center which focused on the Center for Youth Justice. Um, and then like they did do some on the ground field work, right? Um, I'm not sure if the type of work that I wanna do is gonna, is gonna be like Vera, but I do know that I, I'm, I want that dynamic. Like I want the dynamic of being in academia, but also being a part of these communities, which is the reason why that's my initiative for this year and the rest of, <laughs> my rest of the time that I'm here, I'm not gonna produce work about communities that I'm not engaging with, which is the reason why I'm spending my time in the Sisterhood Project, right? This is something, this is an, an, an uh, organization that, not ac that was not academic. Like it didn't start with the Unsilenced Lab, which was at Northwestern. No, this was a group of women, Sisterhood women that came together and collected themselves within Inglewood. Unsilenced just found them <laughs> and asked if they would like to illuminate their voices in other ways, right? So this Sisterhood Project wasn't a project that was from Northwestern. Um, and so, like this is uh, being a part of these communities or, or knowing what's actually happening in the communities of the that I'm actually putting academic work in, right? I think that's important, and I think oftentimes that's the reason why I'm doing it because a lot of people don't. Um, a lot of people don't look at these communities. They talk a lot about them or they research a lot about them, but they don't really know the type of narratives. They don't really do, and and that's gosh, I think that's probably. My biggest pet peeve with political science, just a little bit, because we're we're quant heavy, we're quantitative heavy, we're very much in numbers, right? But as far as talking about like interviews or doing focus groups or actually interacting in ways that numbers can't account for, right? That's that doesn't doesn't happen often. I, I value it. I will do quantitative work, but it's going to be coupled with something else, right? Um, to capture these narratives that don't come about. Um, so yeah, I'm not too sure what I'll do in the future, but I do know that I I I value that dynamic. I like academia and I think that, and I, I okay. I appreciate academia. <laughs> like it, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm working in academia, right? And so um, I appreciate what it's doing, um, but I also, that, that is a pet peeve of mine, is, is, is producing work that a lot of these communities do not, um, do not have access to, right? Um, and I, I do hold that dear to me. And eventually, I do plan on. Um, I do plan on doing both. I have to do both. Uh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Magic. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh my God. <laughs> Mm-hmm. It's true. appreciate it. Thank you. Um, aw, I appreciate that. And I, I, I do work hard. It's true. Um, but I also think that uh, me doing this working hard, like I, and, and again, that's the, I do think it's because like life happens and life is hard for a lot of us. Right. And I, and, and, and I think about grades and I think about reviews and I do that. I, and I do, I don't want to say I take it as a, with a grain of salt, but man, like when, when you've been through it and like when it, it's, how can I explain this? Um, when you know that academia is not, it's, it's an important part of your life, but it's not the end all be all, it, it makes this criticism a lot better. It makes this revision a lot better. It makes your, your, your work a little bit more, 
doable, if you will, um, because you're, you're again, you're a person, right? Um, but yeah, I do, I do work hard, and I thank you for appreciating it. But I, I think, I think that that helps when I think about like life. I think about like this isn't, this isn't it. Like this isn't it. it you just keep, you got to keep going. Um, this is just one chapter of your life. So those of you who are going to graduate school, this is again just one chapter of your life, and you are gonna get ripped to shreds. Gosh, I've been ripped to shreds. Um, but <laughs> again, with, especially when you're doing race, ethnicity, and politics work, you always, always, always have to defend why it's important every single time um, to people who don't always understand, right? Um, but take it, take it as it is. Um, know that you're more than it. You're more than just academic, uh, academia. You're more, you're more than just this scholar at this placement, right? Um, so that, that helps me a lot. It really does bring me there. Um, thank you for mentioning that.